Hey everybody, you are listening to the podcast Working Drummer. Greg Morrow is our guest today. It was an honor to speak with him. Greg has been an inspiration for many drummers, including myself, not only for his superb drumming, but for his humble demeanor. Since his move from Memphis to Nashville over two decades ago, Greg's been a favorite among producers for his super solid pocket and musicality that elevates the performance of any track he's on. Some of the many recognizable artists he's worked with include Joe Cocker, Amy Grant, Cheryl Crow, Reba McIntyre, and too many others to list. To find out more about this episode and other episodes we've recorded, you can find us at workingdrummer.net. You can follow us on Twitter at working underscore drummer. We are also on Instagram. You can find us on iTunes where you can subscribe and new episodes will be sent to your smart device every week. If you like what you hear, you can leave us a review and rate the podcast. And finally, we just started a new YouTube channel where you can see videos of our interviews. You can find it under Working Drummer Podcast. So here's Greg Morrow. Been anyone that you've ever met that you've been like, felt starstruck or felt like... I oh, know, I mean, you, of, certainly any anybody that you listened to growing up. Yeah. You know that was so that was formative to you, right. you know. Floyd Sneed from Three Dog Night was a big one for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I I, I w- that from sixty eight to like seventy two. You know, were that was from the time I was ten to the time I was fourteen, sixty eight to seventy two. Okay. So, you know, everything that happens during those years is always way bigger than life. I was a big Don Brewer fan. Never met Don Brewer, but Jim Brown, a friend of mine that been playing with Seeger. Okay. Uh, you know, Donnie plays with Seeger now yeah. and has for a while. But anyway, I ha- I found this really great I know I'm off the path here. Not at all. Great color eight by ten of Don Brewer from back in the day playing his old Red Sparkle Ludwig kit with the, you know, Big fro and the whole shoot match, really good looking picture. And I gave it to Jim. I said, "If you ever get a chance to have Don sign yeah. this, would you?" And and he he signed it on the bass drum head in the picture. Don Brewer signed oh, it for awesome. me, so yeah, it was awesome. really nice. But yeah, those guys. I mean, certainly were. Uh, and Jerry Edmonton from Steppenwolf. I, I, but Steppenwolf and Three Dog Night were two very formative bands for me, and they were really they were very different bands. Right. But yet, they were ones that were impactful. And you, you were saying like 10 to 13, 10 to 14? For me, that's yeah, that's when I was, I mean, at that point, you just kind of, you had a little better understanding of uh, why you liked something or, mm-hmm. or, or you could just tell when something was moving you or whatever, you know, whatever that intangible thing is. Yeah. That moves you inside yeah. becomes really evident. Yeah, at that age, I I, I have a couple of reasons why I, I ask that. Um, partly because right now I, I mentioned my my sons are ten, yeah. and thirteen, and I, they're still at a at a point in their life where I'm introducing music to them. They're not quite discovering it themselves. They're discovering music within my library. Mm-hmm. And I find it curious the things that they're hitting upon right now. It's Queen and Billy Joel, and some Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. The uh, the other thing is, there's times that I tap into that younger version of myself, and what it was that kickstarted me into music and into drums at that age, and and knowing that so much is going on, especially those early teen and those mm-hmm. teenage years, and the development just physiologically and everything that goes along with growing up and how music changes your way of thinking. And uh, so I'm curious to see where my boys are going with it and also uh, when I'm feeling creatively stifled or or not as motivated as I feel like I should be uh, at this age, thinking, what was it like when I was 15 and I was sitting behind the drums and I was discovering all these things. The easiest way to do that is go back and listen to something you loved when you were 15. Right. You know, so. That's why I have that poster there, because that's what I was listening to when I was 15. Yeah, well, <laughs> me too. 
you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, I had gotten I had gotten Rush's first album, you know, with yeah. the other drummer, with John Rutsey as yeah. the drummer. Yeah. And you know, it was just kind of a heavy kind of party band, yeah, kind of sounding sure. thing. Yeah. And I remember when Fly By Night came out, and it was like the RCA dog. You go, huh? Because you know, <laughs> it was such a different it version was. of that band. It was, yeah. you know, and and, and it, I, I wasn't real sure yeah. what I thought about it. You know, they took a left turn. It, for sure. Well, it just it blossomed into this other thing. Yeah, you know, I, I, for sure. Um, it just was not that band anymore. So it was yeah. a, you know, the different. I wanted to ask you about Three Dog Night. Um, this uh, group that I work with, we're actually going to be doing a show with them in a. In a a couple months out mm-hmm. in Colorado. Oh, cool. Do you know who's touring with them now? I don't know who the drummer is. Uh, um, I don't know his name offhand, but I, I'm pretty sure it's the same guy that's been there a number of years now. Uh-huh. Um, and Mike also, the the original guitar player, I think is back with them. Uh, I mean, he has been he had been back with them for a while. Okay. Uh, and. They just lost Jimmy, the keyboard player, Green, Jimmy Greenspoon. He just passed in the last few months. Oh, so wow. I know that was probably a pretty big blow to them. And Danny and Corey are the, you know, the two singers. Chuck's not with them. Okay. Um, so I guess it's three of the very original guys. It was four of the very original guys, okay. and now it's three. As long as there's three, they can still hold on to the name. Well, th- y- you know, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Rim shot. <clears throat> it's funny that you go there because that it, 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 the first thing that came to my mind was Skinnerd because oh. that that was contractually they actually have it's a, it's a contractual thing there has to be you know a certain living member kind of thing and mm-hmm. and and in a way they kind of backed into it with Ricky Medlock. Mm-hmm. Because he was the original drummer before Bob Burns, you know he mm-hmm. cut the he recorded the stuff in Muscle Shoals. I'm pretty sure I got this right. Anyway, he's, you know, he was in the band before they ever signed to MCA. Okay. So the, they could make the case that yeah, Ricky was, you know, before he was in Blackfoot, you know, he was in Skinnerd, oh. and uh, and so there's that. Wow. It, it there's, I feel like I have a good understanding. Of music history, whether it's classic rock or jazz or and and country, has been a constant learning experience for me in the last sixteen years, and I really enjoy understanding the history. But just when I feel like I, I get a grip on it, there's this new information that that's what's been fun about talking with drummers and, and oh yeah, stuff. yeah. I'm learning getting, something every mm-hmm. week. Yeah, you know, I and you. I hope other and people as they are too, I'm sure. You know, yeah. <laughs> Um, not for me, but, uh, <laughs> so tell me about, um, tell me about this week. Like I, I'm just, well, you, it, you know, crazy week <laughs> because, because the question I had set up is, is there ever a typical week? No, for you. There's never a typical week. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Well, it's just, that's the nature of, you know, lone wolf employment, yeah. Which is what this is. Not the name of your company. No, it's just no. <laughs> it's just the reality of the situation. You yeah. know, you you wait for the phone or the text message or the email of someone needing your service. That's what you do. Yeah. You know, uh, there are situations you can be in, and I'm fortunate enough to have a couple that I know are going to provide certain amounts of work spread over the course of the year. It's not a full year's worth of work. Mm-hmm. But it's mm-hmm. at least something that's kind of spotting, you know, through the year. Right, right, right. You know, right. but 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 around that, you could literally be this week not knowing what you're going to do next week. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, it can be that way. And then, but when was the last time it was that way for you, where you weren't sure? It hasn't been that long ago. Really? I mean, yeah, with the changing nature of the business, I mean, 10 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, you could easily be six weeks full in your calendar ahead, mm-hmm. at least with something day to day or, you know, four to five things in a week, in each week, you know, of the next six. Yeah. Um, we jokingly refer to it as the snowstorm. My calendar <laughs> looks like a snowstorm, meaning all white. 
Yeah. <laughs> you <Okay. know? laughs> Nothing written in it. You know? <laughs> and Dan, Dan Dugmore <laughs> has the best philosophy about that, uh, about getting book obsessed, you know, mm-hmm. obsessed with your right. book. He says, I never look ahead in my book. I always, I, I look back. He says, if I look back, it, it gives you confidence that things will happen. Oh, yeah. You know, regardless of what the future looks like, if you look back and see what the history is, uh-huh. you know, uh-huh. it was, it's just an interesting take on on things. And, and especially if you feel like you've established a good work relationship with some of those <laughs> accounts and some of those writers and producers. Well, a good relationship certainly helps. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you just got to realize you can't – you can't you can't be possessive about any of that stuff because it's not yours. What do you mean by that? It's not yours. Yeah. It's their job. Yeah. It's not your job. Yeah. You work at their pleasure. Yeah. You know, you see what I'm saying? But how do you make you a part of their job? You a part of their project? You make them happy when you work for them. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. You, you you be a professional. You you do your, you do your job for them when they ask you to do it. Yeah, I know that sounds like an oversimplification. But, no, yeah, I but it's the truth. Yeah. you know. Okay. But I mean, that to me, that's a truth across everything. Yeah. You know, the job you do, unless it's your company. Yeah. Is is it's not your job. You're working at someone's pleasure and the and at, with an agreement. Mm-hmm. That you're going to deliver X for Y in return, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and 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 that's the deal. Yeah, you know, um, I I guess it's just a of you're not owed anything. Mm-hmm. You're not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I kind of had this question for further on down the road, but. Um, just in relation to to this, it, it, do you feel like when people call you, you're hired to play like Greg Morrow? Do you ever, especially at this stage in your career, do you feel like I yeah, I would have a problem saying it's it's <laughs> <laughs> it's because I play like Greg Morrow. It, I think I, I mean people call you because yeah. they know what you do. And how you do it, and they have an appreciation for that. That's why they call. Yes. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, why, or, 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 <laughs> or, God, I can't believe it, man. I had this guy booked, and he just bailed on me. What are you doing tomorrow at 10? And yeah. it's like, yeah. well, I'm, I'm open. I can come cover it, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. that, too. Well, and I, maybe it's a kind of a rhetorical question, Um but at the same time, I, I, I think that um, – and we've talked about this before where I feel like we always sound our best when we play like we play. Uh, and I think that there are certain players that get hired uh, – and, and I'm kind of thinking more of the session world. They're getting hired to provide their sound, their – approach their feel their backbeat all that stuff for maybe four out of the ten songs on this record or uh, for this particular artist this record um, so I I guess I'm just trying to figure out how to how to um, find out is there a, ever been a time when you say, well, we're looking for this kind of feel. Can you bring this snare drum? Can you do this? Can you do that? And maybe there was a time when you first moved to Nashville, when you were first doing sessions, that you felt like you had to kind of adapt a little bit more where I'm just wondering if you're, if you're at a place where you come in, you do your thing, thank you. I mean, I know you're going to provide, you're going to do the best. You're working for this other person. Uh, you're making them happy. But... I feel like, hey, I want I want Greg on this. Call Greg. He's going to come in and he's going to do his thing. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure there. Yeah, I'm that... sure there are instances of that. I don't ever think about it. Yeah. Um. 
And am I overthinking it? <laughs> maybe a little. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I think I think I think your first thing of you always sound the best when you when you do what you do. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And and I just you know. I don't. I don't perceive that I really changed anything when I moved to town. I don't perceive that I did. Mm-hmm. I, I think. I think the obvious thing was is I. Ha- I had to listen to things differently because stylistically I was stepping into a slightly different uh, genre. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I actually had a fairly deep country background growing up from my family and and playing in bands at a very early age, you know, 11, 12 years old, 13 mm-hmm. years old, mm-hmm. that would play enlisted men's clubs and country club dances and mm-hmm. and things like that where they wanted for the good times and, and playing hotel lounges mm-hmm. and stuff mm-hmm. uh, where the, the deeper catalog of traditional country stuff, mm-hmm. that's – what they wanted, right. they wanted that crying your beer stuff. I see. Yeah, you know, you know well, what I'm saying. And so I, I guess, I mean, I had that tucked away in the in the mental library. You know. Sure. Well, can we go back and talk about where you're from and, and do whatever you want to? <laughs> it's your show. <laughs> yeah. Not today, Greg. It is your show. Do you have any <laughs> questions for me? <laughs> no, seriously. Um, you're, are you from Memphis? I, I was raised there, yeah. I was actually born, and I always make this distinction because I, I love the little town. Uh, an hour north of there in Ripley, Tennessee is where my family's roots are. Okay. It's just straight up Highway 51, you know, right on the Mississippi River. All my cousins, aunts, uncles, everything. You know, my mom and dad were raised there. Mm-hmm. Grandparents, oh, wow. all there, and or just you know, right in that immediate area. Area, my dad. When my, I guess I, I never really. I'm putting these pieces together just from evidence. I guess I could ask my mom. She's up here visiting this weekend, and oh, yes. I could. But I, I like what I've invented just as well. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my dad, <clears throat> when my parents got married, uh, my dad's uncle got him a job. Uh, in the cotton business down on Front Street in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when they got married, they had a little apartment in Memphis. My mom got pregnant with me like two months after they got married. Mm -hmm. They were married in May, late May of 57, and I was born in June of 58. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pretty quick they had a – well, they had me. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I think I really think what the deal was why I was born in Ripley was that's where my mom's doctor was, you know. So oh, wow. you know, yeah. I just think that it was just one of those things where they didn't have a doctor in Memphis, and and the hospital was there, the family was there, so she just decided she wanted me to be born up there. Yeah. That's all I can figure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so yeah, I was born in Ripley, hour north of Memphis, but raised in Memphis. Okay, you know. Uh, and then, um, was there something that ha- that inspired your interest in music, and eventually drums, or was it uh, your family? Was it Memphis? Was um, it- well, certainly Memphis was a very convenient place to be if you liked music. Yeah, at, especially in the late fifties uh, and the very early sixties, but. Uh, Lots of gospel music in my family growing up. My my mom and her parents had a trio that sang in the Assembly of God Church. And then my dad sang bass in a quartet, and his little brother sang bass in, in another quartet. You know, mm-hmm. these just a little, I mean, little church quartets, you know, that yeah. would just get together and sing hymns and such. Uh, and my grandfather on my dad's side— hmm? Sorry. I'm sorry. My grandfather on my dad's side uh, had a guitar, and and evidently back in back in his earlier years was quite a rebel rouser, and would sit on the porch and kind of howl the blues a little bit when he'd have a nip or two. Yeah. 
but but he <clears throat> he had he had quit drinking by the time I was born, or you know, not that he was a drunk. I'm not saying he, but but you know, sure, it's just in the interest of this is what I'm going to do on a Friday night. I'm going to sit on the porch and play my guitar and maybe have a little nip. But right. uh, and he had quit playing, you know. He, and just, I guess, when he put one aside, I guess he just, by association, he said that was, you know. <laughs> All right. But anyway, I would, when I was a kid, I just remember seeing that guitar and being real intrigued with it. And, and, and back to my dad's little brother, he had records. He had a bunch of 78s yeah. um, at the time. And I just remember... Those records being around the house and hearing them, uh, you know, Little Richard, it, 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 Jerry Lee Lewis, mm-hmm. Fats Domino, mm-hmm. but he was also Tennessee Ernie Ford and and Pat Boone, and a pretty wide range of stuff. I mean, he had a pretty eclectic collection for someone as dirt poor as they were. Um, and that's kind of my earliest recollection of being just hypnotized with hearing something that I didn't know what, you know, it just, to quote Bobby Fields, it worked my monkey nerve, <laughs> you know, it, it just, it wound me up, yeah. you know, and I, I just, somehow or another, I started beating on things, yeah. furniture, the footstools, pots and pans, oatmeal boxes, you know, my grandmother would say she had to hide her big stewers, what she, you know, called her stewers, those big pots like that. Oh, right, right. Because right. I would beat the bottoms. Yeah. I would concave the bottoms of her stewers <laughs> with the wooden spoons, and, and, you know, they wouldn't conduct heat anymore because they'd be, they'd be uh, <laughs> beat, the, you know, beat the bottoms in. That's great. And so uh, they started getting me these little paper drum sets, you know, when I was three or four years old, I guess. Holy mountain. You know, and they would just last no time. I mean, they'd get me one of these paper drum sets and, you know, a couple of days, maybe, you know, just wouldn't last any time. And uh, were the shells like cardboard? They no, they were the the the, the heads were paper, yeah. and the, and the shells themselves were were really thin, like sheet metal. Okay. And the springs held the yes, I had, yeah, they had yeah. little hooks on them and just springs. I, you know, just not much at all. Right. And, and, you know. Right. They only really kind of marginally looked like a drum set. They didn't function as one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was kind of the – and, you know, all, all, while all this is happening, the Beatles are getting ready to explode, and, and right. you know, everybody and their brother wants a guitar, and uh, all the Sears Christmas catalogs now have instrument sections, and you see all these pictures of these cool-looking kids playing guitars or drums or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. it's just uh, – explodes like that you were like i want to look like that kid in the or just that's it just seems like the thing to do yeah you know or or i mean for me it was a very unexplainable i i do i will say this i do think it's absolutely god's will for my life i think i think my talent is a is that blessing mm. because it was all i i've i've i don't remember ever not playing Right. If that makes any sense at all, I, it's an innate thing that has been in me since I drew my first breath, I guess, yeah. because I don't – it came so naturally. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the progression of it. It's never even really been a thought at any point in my life. Yeah. You know, <laughs> of, do is this what I'm going to do or – it just always was. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know? My dad always had the harder time kind of, I don't want to say accepting it, but I guess believing that it might really be my life path. Mm. And I think part of it was him trying to be what he considered, uh, you know, or, or offering me what he considered was good guidance. Yeah. Be prepared for, you know, whatever. And I, and I think his thing was when I finally did go to college, he thought, well, 
you can get a degree in this and be a band director or teach or, or yeah. you know, or whatever. Yeah. And, but, I mean, when I was in college, our band got a record deal. <laughs> and so, you know, I had to go, I had to tell him I wasn't going back mm-hmm. from, you know, for my fourth year and, and it did not sit well. Right. You know. Was there ever a moment in his life where you, th- where he had that, Okay, he's he's fine. This is it for him. It was the year before he died. He died in 1998. I'm sorry. It's all right, man. But he came up to visit. <laughs> We went out to eat, and he stole a steak knife because <laughs> I said I liked it. So he made sure I had one. <laughs> but anyway, we had moved to Franklin yeah. into our, our house, you know, our new home. Mm-hmm. With my daughter had started school. And my parents came up for a visit. It's the only time he came up. It was the only time he got to come wow. up. But your daughter was old enough. She got to know your parents. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Anyway, he said we were sitting out on the patio. And, you know, he was just saying, you know, how are things going? Yeah, yeah. Everything okay? I said, yeah, Dad, things things are going good. And he said, well, he said, I really think you should just keep doing what you're doing. Because he could see the evidence, mm-hmm. you know. We had made this step. Was this your first house? or no. no. No, but I'm just saying it was a big move. We had moved from Memphis. We lived two doors down from them in Memphis. I see. And we had moved up here, and, and it was just a combination of all the stuff. Yeah. You know, he could... When he'd hit the radio dial, yeah. he'd hear a song that I, that was me. He knew it was me, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. he knew I played on that song. Yeah, yeah. So it was just a, a compiling of the empirical evidence, if you will, that, mm-hmm. ah, you know, he he has followed this path. Yeah. And here he is, you know, yeah. this, he's landed here. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think doing it here in this community that had such a different perception there's such a different perception especially at the time in Memphis it was really dead mm-hmm. you know a dead a dead business community not a dead musical mm-hmm. situation mm-hmm. wonderful music always right. happens there but at the time you could not make a living doing it you mm-hmm. just couldn't mm-hmm. and you know, there was Hee Haw. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. grow up seeing all these TV shows that originate out of here. And, and right. to to him, it was like the big league. You landed in the big league, and they've, they've taken you. They've accepted you. Yes. And you're working in that venue now. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was that last little bit of confirmation yeah. for him. And so that's a really long... <laughs> <laughs> answer to the question you asked. No, I understand, and and <clears throat> I'll tell you what, Greg, I I completely relate. Um, uh, like I said, my grandfather just had reservations for many years on why I was doing what I was doing, and it's, and it wasn't even like I was playing an instrument that he completely understood. Maybe if I was a singer or a saxophone player or could. guitar anything that sounded yeah. like music drums right. drums don't sound like music Even to, to a the lot point of where when i was in college <laughs> i i dragged up a 5 octave marimba to his place to show him what i was working on <laughs> and i was playing this marimba piece and he says would can you just play a song that i know? <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, like a sorry i don't know Not all of me fugue. right <laughs> i was playing some 20th century modern piece or something just to show my four mallet skills that was just that was the wrong approach yeah but i can say that i hadn't moved to nashville at the time but he was starting to see that i was out of school and i was 
working in multiple bands and teaching and doing as much as I could in music, as much as I could in Columbus. And he and I were sitting there having dinner, and I'm in my mid-twenties, and uh, he goes, you know, when you play with your band, uh, do you guys wear suits? Do you dress up? You know, I was telling him about my top 40 band. Mm-hmm. Well, no, no, no. I mean, we might wear a nice cool shirt, but I don't really, didn't even hardly dress up there. We don't match. No, right. Mm-hmm. Well, you should wear matching suits. And when you're back there, you should, um, we're at Denny's, you know, and he's he's throwing his arms around. And he's because you need to spin your sticks and look at the audience. And I'm thinking of... Gene Krupa and Gene Krupa and Papa Joe smiling yeah, yeah, and yeah. all these things and hamming like, it up right and I'm like oh my gosh and I tell you what Greg that was for me one of the best conversations that I ever had with my grandfather that I remember because he was digging deep at his limited knowledge of music to give me advice yeah to to do what he thought was supporting you yeah and that's what he knew yeah and man. That was just, that was awesome. That was um, because he knew, no- now his, my grandmother knew a lot about music, but he knew nothing and he claimed to know nothing. But he found one thing that he remembered and shared it with mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. And of course, at, at, right at that moment, I thought, Grandpa, come on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, the light came rolling. on later, yeah. Yes, yes. And, and I think he passed away maybe a, a year after that conversation. And so it was, Luckily, that, that, that I had remembered that, and um, that was significant yeah. in his opening to that. So I understand, man. I completely understand. Oddly enough, my grandparents were a far easier sell than my parents. <laughs> you know, they, they were always very supportive and yeah. all in mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. You know, just thought it was just the best thing ever. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> And I, th- I got to tell you, they were Depression-era people as well. Worked at the box factory for nine cents a day or whatever, you know. Jeez. And uh, I think as much as anything, it was if he can find anything where he doesn't have to work as hard as we worked, you know. It, that's That's what we want him to have is not to have to do what we did. Because they, you know, they went through all that. My granddad was a bricklayer. I mean, you talk about some hard work. Because in oh, the I summers, know. I would, <clears throat> I would, you know, I would quote go work with him. You know, when I was a kid, and you know, I'm just not capable of really doing much of anything. But man, you talk about some men out there working, just unbelievable. Oh, I know it. I and know it. and and you know what? He would have laid bricks till the day he died. He loved it so much. He just loved it. He, I mean, he built. I can drive around Ripley to this day, and just dang near anywhere I look, there's something he built in that yeah. town. You know, it's like and, your father and, and, listening and, to the radio and, and hearing you. Yeah, he he and my uncle worked together. My uncle Joe David mm-hmm. um, built stuff. T- you know, all all through that town and all through that Dyersburg, that whole. West Tennessee region, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, I really think that was the crux of it was to not, you know, not have to work like they did. I hear stories of people in the Depression that would have their last nickel and choose to spend it on a silent movie, get get into a movie, to be entertained, to forget their worries, mm-hmm. then to spend it on food or something. Those sto- I, I I mean, you always hear. I've heard those stories all my life about when times are tough. People turn people turn to things like that mm-hmm. for that very reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the guy I was telling you, my band in college got a record deal with Larry Raspberry was the guy, and that's his real name, Larry Raspberry, and the High Steppers. Mm-hmm. And 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 that was what he would always say: "We deal in temporary relief." You know, when you come for these three or four hours, you're free of everything. And, I mean, he would tell the band that so that we'd know what our mission statement was. Yeah, yeah. These You don't know what these people are leaving at the door Wow. when they come in here. Yeah, yeah. But they're, they're bringing hard-earned money 
to see you do your thing. Yeah. To see us do our thing. Yeah. And we better damn well do it. Another person we talked to was Steve Eby, and he had um, mentioned you and the times that he was at Memphis State, mm-hmm. and um, you would come hang out. Yeah, occasionally. I, I mean, I never, I never really. I had a lot of friends there, you know, and and among the faculty and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I stayed kind of tight with a lot of those people for a long time. Is that where you went to school? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And what were you studying there? I wasn't studying. <laughs> you know, as it turns out, I was just treading water. You know, yeah. I mean, I gained I gained a lot of knowledge there. Uh, you know, I got to tweak um, what reading ability I do have. Those concentrated three years of being there really focused that, and and I use that to this day. Mm-hmm. You know, but but. You know, I had to have a lot of help even to to get a scholarship. I had to get a friend of mine. I didn't read really anything in high school. I had to get a buddy of mine to teach me how to read my solo piece for my audition. Wow. You know? Okay. I, I, just, I just didn't have that background, you know? Were you memorizing the, the, the pieces or were you— Well, in <laughs> in high school, I was the only snare drummer, so no, I just made up shit. <laughs> I just played what, you know, I played a beat, a good, solid, steady beat. Yeah. And and the band director was an old jazzer from Louisiana mm-hmm. and a great guy named Julius Lartigue. Mm. And he played sax and he played drums. And, and, you know, to his credit, he, he saw in me, yeah. you know, an ability, mm-hmm. and he would encourage me, but he also knew as a as a point of utility <laughs> for the band. Yeah. This is what I've got to work with. I'm just going to let him play the beat, yeah. Because we were just playing beginnings and you know just pet band stuff essentially. Even in marching band, we didn't really play anything difficult. You know, we just played contemporary kind of the horse, you know, stuff like that. Mm. Uh, so really, all you had to do was make up a little beat and just play it. Yeah. And if you kept good time, that was enough. Yeah. You know, so. With the band that you were assigned with uh, <laughs> out of college when when you left school, did you record with them? Yeah, we did a record okay. for Mercury. Mm-hmm. Okay. And was that in Memphis? We cut it in Memphis. Okay. I mean, we recorded the record in Memphis. Were you recording much in Memphis at that time? <sighs> um. Or what was your experience in the studio? That was very uh, certainly very 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 early on in in my recording process, whatever you want to call it. I <clears throat> I had been in a band when I was in sixth grade. That there was a little local tell. There were two local TV shows, music shows. One was called Talent Party. And it was the bigger deal show. It had George Klein was the host, and he was the big AM disc jockey. And this show was like 5 o'clock on Saturday afternoon, Saturday early evenings mm-hmm. is when Talent Party would come on. Well, there was also another show. Uh, Harry Winfield was, was a black gentleman and had a variety show that came on at like 11 p.m. on Friday nights mm-hmm. that was called Swing Shift. And it was a more R&B-centered, you know, uh, show, yeah. Well, <laughs> somehow or another, this little band I was in when I was in the sixth grade, we actually had a black singer, and our band and two other bands, the Sands of Time, and I'm trying to think of what the the name of the third band escapes me now. But all three of us went. We had the we had this a uh, same manager, which was one of the guy's dads. You know? Okay, yeah. Anyway, he had an end with this TV show. All three of these bands, we literally went to the TV station to do an audition, mm-hmm. and they took all three of us. Oh. They took all three bands. They said, "Oh yeah, we'll you know, uh, we'll put you on." Yeah. Which I thought was was really pretty cool. Did you say sixth grade? 
Yeah. Okay. Sixth grade. Anyway, we did we did like River Deep Mountain High, and I, we did two songs on this TV show. Anyway, so back in those days, when you're playing these shows, you you don't play live in the in the studio when you're really doing the show. Okay. You know, you always lip sync. So we had to go to a recording studio and make our backing track. Mm-hmm. And and that was the first time I'd ever been in a recording studio and recorded. And it was with a very legendary figure in Memphis music. His name is Roland Janes. And he worked at Sun wow. with, with Sam Phillips and played guitar on Jerry Lee Lewis records. And, I mean, Mr. Roland had been around. He, he cut... Uh, I think Scratchy by Travis Womack and, uh, you know, he, I mean, a legendary figure in Memphis music lore. Yeah. Really gracious guy. And we, we go to, he had a studio called Sonic that he had finally started his own place. And it was just a, literally, I'm at the time, just a mono studio. I mean, it was, it had a full track tape machine. That's all it had. Wow. You know, so you played and sang live, no headphones. Okay. And and he would just balance you, you know. Did you ask for more 2K? <laughs> yeah. Can you turn the click down? Uh, so he would just balance you in the room, you know, and, and your amps would be behind you, and he'd have you me, me kind of tucked over here, a couple of mics on the – he had a mixer, but he was mixing everything to mono as you went. And you sang into these RCA ribbon mics, you mm-hmm. know. But once again, there's no headphones. You're just singing like we're talking into this mic. That's what you hear. You, you're not. There's nothing. No monitoring at all. Yeah. So you know, you try to blend yourselves on the fly. I just I can only imagine what he was thinking when this bunch of toe-headed, you know, eleven, twelve-year-old kids come into this place to do their back and track. You know, I could just see his eyes going, "Oh God." You know, but we did okay. I yeah. still have that tape someplace. I was going to say you you have some vivid memory. I, I can't remember what I did last year. <laughs> so how you remember these songs? How you remember the situation? And well, it's just that impactful in your life. Yeah, I mean, it was a seminal event mm-hmm. for me. You know, sixth grade. That's eleven years old, probably twelve, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, eleven, I think. Do you have the the video? Do you have? No, they you know they would recycle those videotapes. I mean, when when you would when you would video, I think we went in on a Thursday or a Wednesday and did the videotape to the backing track. And I remember how hard it was to stay up till eleven p.m. on Friday night, <laughs> you know, to try to watch it on TV. Yeah, you know, it was hard. I, I don't know that I'd ever stayed up that late before, you know. <laughs> uh, but they, they, it's the same thing with Talent Party. It's a real shame, especially with Talent Party, because, they, I mean, they had everybody on that show. Any national act that would come through town would do, come do a cameo there. And none of that video, they would just recycle it week to week, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, r- there's There are rumors that some of it exists someplace, but it, it hasn't surfaced. So I, oh, wow. I wish it would. That uh, talent party was the f- was the first time I ever saw Aldridge play when when he had joined Black Oak, Arkansas in seventy two I guess maybe uh, they they came mm-hmm. yeah they came to town to to do talent party their their third album was coming out which was the first album he played on if an angel came to see you would you make her feel at home and just blew my mind wow what he was doing I'm like. <laughs> I'd never in my life really seen anything like that. I, Floyd Sneed played double bass, but this was a whole different thing. It was a much more aggressive. Mm-hmm. He was using it all the time, mm-hmm. you know, and just, you know, T.A., his, his look. I mean, he had that look back then. You know, he's just cut and, mm-hmm. you know, Sinewy. big hair and, yeah, <laughs> just just looked like a savage, you know. Yeah. And and he, he was fully formed, <laughs> I, I can tell you. I mean, he was. I, I mean, his his whole deal as oh, a player, the whole shoot match was there in seventy two or three, whenever that was. I mean, it was immediately there. Wow. Anyway, back to the point of 
it was that kind of thing you could see on Talent Party. Yeah. And what an amazing thing. What a, I mean, yeah. and, was that just kind of an inspiration, that whole experience? Say, oh, certainly, great. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was one, just one of those things. Uh, it was one of your early goals, you know. That, that was a benchmark that you wanted to reach, you know. Oh, if I could just, if we could just get on Talent Party, man, whatever, you know. Yeah. It's like the stair step of goals. It is a stair step, but I, th- I think for many of us to do that, it starts around 18 to, you, you know, even in your mid-20s, you're th- hoping to do this. But you, you're at 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. You're like, this is my goal. And it, is, it happened. It happened. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it did. It was you know, It was just one of those weird little situations. We, we, we were associated w- with the generation that was just ahead of us. You know, I mean, there were friendships there, and we would kind of run in and out of that circle. And mm-hmm. I don't know, it was just that closeness. I guess you'd call it riding on coattails or something, you know. Of, of But they accepted us, yeah. you know, and would kind of pull us along, Yeah. you know. And was Memphis a better place to work as a musician at that time? Did you feel like some of those people— those older players that you were aspiring to be more like was was the environment better at that time? Because I know that well, I didn't really on, have anything to compare it to. I, I guess you'd I would have I to compare it. then to now. Right, right. Uh, right. I, Memphis has always had a a decent level of camaraderie within the community on some levels. Um. I mean, it marches to the beat of its own drummer, certainly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it really does. And uh, that's all fine and good, you know. Uh, when I was growing up there, just there were amazing players there, mm. you know, th- that – a lot of them, a lot this? of them may or may not have ever done anything outside of that world, mm-hmm. but you knew how good they were. You could tell how good they were. Did you go out and watch? Them? When I could, you know, you can't do a whole lot at that age. Right, right. You know, you could um, even stay up to eleven on a Friday. <laughs> well, that was a physical. You know, that was just stamina. <laughs> no, it was. Being ex- exposed was it was tough on that. That's why that TV show was so important. Right. I mean, you they would. It was really a it was a locally centered show, you know. So you you would see guys that you'd see at the music store or or wherever, mm-hmm. you know, and you'd see them on TV and hear them play and all that stuff. So I, it was that's really what the exposure was. Did you guys get work from that TV show? Nah. No. Nah. Yeah. Not really. I mean, there's not a lot. There's just not a lot you can do at that age, right? Right. In terms of paying gigs, you can play some birthday parties and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I think and, that's that's what I was wondering. Is but uh, uh, and we did a we did a little of that. It wasn't I, my first real tangible economic return, you know, on playing. Probably happened in the summer, like between my eighth and ninth grade years. We we would. We got in at the military base mm-hmm. in Millington, and you could play two week stints out there. Okay, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it was good money at mm-hmm. the time. I mean, you'd make a couple of hundred bucks a week mm-hmm. per guy, mm-hmm. which in nineteen seventy two or seventy one is not horrible money for really anybody, mm-hmm. but especially not a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. you know. My 13-year-old would love a couple hundred bucks a week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was when, you know, it it started becoming a, an economic investment, you know, yeah. or a, an economic return on my investment, yeah. you know, in playing. Mm-hmm. I'm really not saying any of this right. It's just when when it started becoming a gig. I see. <laughs> you I, see. Know? I see. Uh, was Nashville on the horizon at that point or, or later on? Uh, Nashville was never on the horizon until 
<laughs> probably 91 or two. Okay. Um, I had done a big tour with Amy Grant mm -hmm. in 1988 and 1989. Mm -hmm. Big tour, 18 month tour. And at that point had, had made the most money I'd ever made in my life. Was this her first record? Hmm? I'm trying. No, no, no. It wouldn't be her first. No, it was "Lead Me On." Okay, it was okay. like her fifth or sixth album. She okay. was huge at the time. Yeah, that's. I think that's what. I'm, hmm? Just before Baby Baby, yeah. just before. Okay, okay. But she was she was busting, and this tour was arenas sold out. You know, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two thousand people a night. Jeez. And. Um, so I had quit the band I was in. I was in a band called DeGarmo and Key at the time, yeah. which was the same. It was the same genre of music, a CCM band. We were a much harder edge band, you know. I remember that band. Yeah, yeah it yeah. was a much harder edge band, and I had invested almost ten years in that in that band. I say invested. I'd been a part of it. Sure, you know? sure. And and we had our own little thing going, you know. We would do records and tour, tour a couple of, you know, tour in the spring, tour in the fall, festivals in the summer, do a record. Mm -hmm. And you know, it. I guess it had reached a plateau to me that I really didn't know it had reached until I thought I had an option. Mm -hmm. Um, we were kind of in between things mm -hmm. and i got a call out of the blue i'm, I'm backtracking a little bit and i'm yeah, sorry sure, no worries. um i got a call out of the blue from amy's management mm -hmm. asking if i would be if i would ever consider coming to play on a tour mm -hmm. for her and i'm immediately thinking well there's there's no way i can unless i quit you know eddie and dana and and I guess I was surprised at my lack of resistance to the thought in my mind. I, I guess it immediately, I understood it to be a crossroads moment, hmm. you know, of examination and have I, you know, have I done all I can do here? What, you know, is there anything for me? further here other than what we're doing yeah and uh i told him i'd do it yeah <laughs> and then i had to go and tell eddie and dane i was leaving the band and i think <laughs> i told them i was 29 years old and my wife was planning me a surprise 30th birthday party that she had invited all the band guys to. And I think I told Eddie and Dana like the day before my surprise birthday party that I didn't know they were going to come to. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so it was, you know, mildly awkward at the at the birthday. But they but they were very gracious. They I mean, they certainly understood. Yeah, they, there was n no way they could match what was being offered to me, mm -hmm. you know, at the time. Mm -hmm. And um uh, I I have to backtrack a little bit because I did have a, pr a prior relationship with Amy through DeGarmon Key. In 1980, uh, they hired us, DeGarmon Key, to back her up. She had never had a band before live. It was just okay. her and an acoustic guitar player. Uh -huh. And they wanted to, you know, they wanted to try to move her to this next level. Yeah. And they kind of understood what that was going to entail. So they wanted to record a live album, which they didn't have a band to record it with. So they hired us to do it. Mm -hmm. And we rehearsed a couple of weeks or a week or so mm -hmm. with her and uh, went and record. We did two shows. We did a show in Tulsa and a show in Oklahoma City, and they recorded both of them, and they got two albums out of it. Wow. So, <laughs> so wow, nice. it paid off in spades. And then we went out l later that year and, and toured in support. Of, okay. of that album mm -hmm. as her band. Okay. And we got to play a song or two kind of in the middle of the set to her audience, which was <clears throat> equal parts interesting and exciting. Oh, cool. You know. As to Garmo and Keith. Yeah, as to Garmo oh, okay. and Keith. Yes, yeah. 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 So we, and we, we talk about that. You know, I, I still work with Amy and, and she always 
makes it a point to say, you know, the first band I ever played with, he was in. Wow. uh, Because I know that Gary mentioned that you were still doing Christmas tours with her. Well, I do. I do everything she does. Yeah. When if you know, generally, if she's playing a gig someplace, I'm there. Okay. You know, our our band. We have a good band. Um. So. Um, I don't know why '88 or '89. I thought that was something new for her uh, because. No, nah, she had she uh, her straight ahead was her first big step towards uh, you know what was becoming her her becoming a more pop act, mm-hmm. and it was straight ahead, and then I think Unguarded, uh, which had Love Will Find a Way and some more pop centered oh, right, sounding right, right. things on it. And then Lead Me On was after that. And Lead Me On, it, you should really listen to that album sometime. It's 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 not pop. It's a it's fairly introspective in a way, but it sounds amazing. Paul Lyme played on it. He was playing on all her stuff at the time. And uh, and it to me to my ear at the time it it marked a real move forward in in her thing and. The tour was really successful. I don't really know how successful the album was, but the tour was very successful. And people mm-hmm. loved coming to see that show. Mm-hmm. And then uh, this is kind of getting back to the Nashville thing. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so I do this tour. Yeah. Come home and am not asked back to to do the next tour. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, here's another one of those crossroads moments. And, and what you're learning is... You are you, and you are all you can depend on. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it gets back to the thing of it was the first realization of it's not your gig; it's their gig to do with what they want to. Right. You know. Right. And and it and it that was not fully realized at the time. I can look back and say, okay, that was the first time that that you know that was what the understanding of that. But. uh so I'm going, well, crap, you know, I've left d and and I, I did have a studio in Memphis with a buddy of mine, James Craft, and, and his dad, Howard, whom I learned so much from. Mm. I had been involved with them since my late teens and early 20s uh, in, in their little recording studio situations. Mm-hmm. And um, so at this point, when I when when I was flush, as they will say, <laughs> when I was flush, we had bought an Eve console. We were the first studio in Memphis to have an Eve console. Oh, cool. We bought a brand new Neve console, put it in, James and I. So I had this studio situation, and I'm just trying to figure it out. You know, I know I'm not going to be asked back for this tour, so I, I start playing kind of locally again, and and and. You know, I'm doing what sessions I can, and I'm learning to engineer a little bit, so I'm mixing some jingles and editing and this kind of thing. And I'm in, like, three or four different bands because each of them have a night a week at a club. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. So you do Tuesday with this band, Thursday, Friday, Saturday with these other – just those kind of things. It's just catch as catch can, and you're working your butt off. Right. And you're not making jack. You're just, you know, you're topping out at 30, 35 grand a year. At this point, you know, I have a child, you know, a young child and a wife. And, and my wife was flying uh, for, for uh, Northwest at the time. She was a flight attendant for Northwest. Okay. So, you know, between the two of us, we're kind of managing. Yeah. But uh, you know this is not something that you can sustain, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so I'm just wondering what to do, you know, and uh, once again, it's that I, I, I had a, a couple of friends, you know, you notice that slow person at a time migration, Trey Bruce moved up here. You know, my, my friend Mike Brignadello had moved up here mm-hmm. in the very early 80s. He was in the Larry Raspberry band with me on Mercury. Okay. He, was, he was in that band with me. Okay. <clears throat> he saw the writing on the wall really early and, and got on up here. Yeah. Um, 
you, you know, you know the history of the Memphis boys and all those people making that journey mm -hmm. up here. And uh, so, I once again, it, it's a phone call out of the blue. I'm sitting at my house, you know, watching my kid. We're watching Barney videos or something. And the phone rings, and it's Scott Hendricks, the, the producer. Mm -hmm. And and he says, man, I've I, my name's Scott Hendricks, and I'm producing the, uh, a new female artist on Warner Brothers, and we you know we feel pretty strong. She's going to be pretty big, and I got you. I've gotten a couple of people, you know, have recommended you. You know, Chad Cromwell. He Chad had already moved up here, prior. right? He's being from Memphis, and um, and Trey, who was involved in a publishing venture with Scott at the time, and Mike Brignadello, who had been doing some showcases with this particular artist. Mm -hmm. They were having trouble finding who they wanted into the drum chair yeah. for whatever reason. Uh, and he just asked, he said, would you ever consider doing this coming up? And, you know, we're going to do it. We've got a last round of auditions happening on this date. And uh, I'd really love it if you'd come up. You know, I, you, these people have so highly recommended you, you know, spoke highly of you um, that, I'd love it if you'd come up and, you know, audition. And I just, I, at that point, it was, sure, you yeah. know, send me the stuff. So he sent me the cassette, you know, and told me what to learn off of it. Right. And and it was Faith Hill. Okay. It was it was that. Um, I, I, had, I had had some minor exposure working up here. Through R.S. Field, I'd I'd recorded some stuff on a Webb Wilder record, mm -hmm. and I and I had done a, a week's worth of sessions with Norbert Putnam, who I'd met in Memphis. I'd I'd worked with him in Memphis on a Jimmy Webb record, and when he was living up here out in uh, Franklin, he had brought me up okay. to do some sessions for him. So I had just that tiniest little bit of exposure to session work up here, mm -hmm. and uh, I came up. And learned that stuff, you know, came up and went to the audition. And, I mean, they they offered it to me, well, right, you know, immediately. Wow. I mean, right there. Yeah. I, that's, I, I'm just, that's just what happened. That's not sure. a comment on anything other than that's just what happened. But it happened fast. It happened really fast. And, and, and this is me still living in Memphis, so I'm running back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, Either come up here to catch a bus and go out and do some gigs with them or what, whatever, you know. I um, rent a room in a friend of mine's house in East Nashville back when it was not the East Nashville that it is today. Sure. Um, get a phone, you know. If I've got nothing going on in Memphis, I come up and just hang out and just listen for the phone. Just to be around, you know, you, you got to be present to win. You always hear that expression. Right, and it's right, just right. like people want the perception that they can call you and you can be there. Yeah. They don't want to feel like they got to track you down and you've got to make a journey. They just want to, you know. Mm -hmm. So having a phone with a voicemail that you can check and return a call at least gives them that perception. And this was 19... This was probably 1990. By this time, probably three or four. Okay. 93 or 94. Mm -hmm. And I and this goes on for a good couple of years. Yeah. And uh, with Faith, um, we were opening. We were the third act on the bill. We were that 20, the 20-minute 20 slot. Right. You know? yeah. Well, and your chops uh, are awesome. Yeah, in twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, after a show one night, Scott called me to the back of the bus, and I, I, I'm having another one of those. Well, here you go, moments, you know. Yeah. And he was very candid. He said, um, "You know, we 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 really love having you in this band, but this is not what you need to be doing." And I'm like, "Well, do you care to share?" <laughs> and he said, "Well." You can work in the studio up here if you're here. He said that, that they will love what you do, mm -hmm. and and I can't tell you I'll hire you on everything I ever do, but uh, I can tell you you will work here if you're here. Yeah. And uh, was that good for you to hear, or was well, that... yeah, coming from once I figured out what his involvement was, you know, and the things he had been doing, and where he where 
where he was in the business. Yeah, and between and between that and what Norbert had told my wife and I mm-hmm. when I was up doing those sessions, we went to lunch, and and he just essentially said the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, we I had gotten my first little pay envelope from the union, and I'm looking at this money. I'm going. This could easily have taken me four or five months mm. to make in Memphis, mm-hmm. you know, easily. Mm-hmm. And my wife is like, "Why? What are we waiting on? You know, why are why are we belaboring this decision? You know, at the same time, we're looking at moving out of our neighborhood in Memphis anyway because of schools, and you know, yeah. thinking about my daughter yeah. getting ready to start school, and it's like, and that just kind of." hit the accelerator and I started I started just driving around looking for where we wanted to live and 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 having having done that session in Franklin with Norbert I was really enamored with that the small town feel of that yeah. and uh <laughs> I've just I I was driving around one day and drove through this neighborhood on Eddie DeGarmo's recommendation said there's a new neighborhood Pretty close to where we live. He lived in Cedarmont off Arno Road. And if you went a little further down 96, there was a new development going in called Barrington. It had maybe three or four houses in it in various stages of construction. And I remember driving in it. And I, I, you know, I guess this is you know, maybe in my mind it plays out this way. But it seems like I literally drove right to this house and just stood there and kind of looked at it. It was, it was not even bricked at the time, I don't think. It may have been brick, but no sheetrock, no nothing. Right. But I remember just looking at this house and thinking, oh, I think this this, this may be it. One. I love this. And took a picture of it and, you know, sent it to my wife. And she came up and, I mean, that's where we landed. Wow. It was right there. Wow. And uh, just think, it was Things were moving really quickly at the time. Yeah, I uh, I had gotten the opportunity to work with Chris Farron and Chuck Howard, you know, two two producers, mm-hmm. and on two newer female artists, one of whom was Leanne Rhymes and the other was Dina Carter. Right, and literally. Two of the very first things I ever did for either of them both went number one. Yeah, and so what you get with that among the peer group and other producers is well, he's not going to be the guy that will blow up the session. You know, he's been on two number one records. He doesn't even live here yet. You, you, you take what I'm saying. It's like it's a confirmation thing, yes. and and, and yeah. I mean they have to they have to feel confident. You know that you're going to be able to come in and play well with others, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and I mean, the first time I went in on Dina's session, it's John Hobbs and Joe Chimay and guys I had never met. They didn't know me from Adam. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they had worked with Paul Lyme all of their careers. Mm-hmm. And they're wondering who in the hell mm-hmm. is this guy, mm-hmm. you know? And all you can do is come in and just, you know, just be a be normal and and just like you said, play like yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and just play, play, read it, re, you know, read what you're playing, uh, find something to identify with in what you're, you know, that's what that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. You find something to grab a hold of in in these situations mm-hmm. musically, and and make it relatable to you, yeah. you know, or where you can relate to it more fully. And, and and not feel like it's a stranger, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, something of uh, my first tour that I ever did when I first moved here was with Dina Carter's husband at the time. Yeah, I, Chris. I know him. Yeah, Chris. Mm-hmm. And um, we did a USO tour in early of two thousand. It's before nine eleven, and we we're in the Middle East and. It was a great experience meeting all these soldiers mm-hmm. and and performing for them. And I think that Dina had another new record out at that time or something. But but we were playing a lot of her music during sound check, and uh, a lot of guys were coming up to us and saying, "Is Dina here?" <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, being a drummer, mm-hmm. 
And he was like, man, check, here's some stuff. Greg Morrow's on this, and I'm getting to know you through some of the recordings and getting to understand some of the stuff that you've done uh, and learning a lot of the drummers that were working a lot in Nashville. So it was my introduction to a lot of what you had done. And uh, so we were listening to her to listen to you. And these soldiers are coming up and say, we heard that Dina Carter's here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. She's not here. It's us. It's just yeah. a bunch of dudes. One of the things that I noticed early on about your playing was um, the sounds that you pull out of the drums uh, to the point where when I hear a recording... I can oftentimes tell that it's you. Um, I hear your snare sound. And, it, and I'm not talking about your pocket, your feel. That's, I think, a different, that's a different subject. I'm thinking just the, the tones that you get. Um, I don't know, can, do you have any insight to that uh, that you can offer? <clears throat> Somebody that's trying to... Um, understand dissect that well you know uh, i know no i know it may be subconscious i know uh, it may you're not thinking certainly about a lot of it uh, certainly a lot of it is instinctual as far as as you're striking the drum you're not really thinking about how you're striking the drum in an ideal world it should be right, right you know right instinctual but you do learn different things you know, you learn that big drums tuned up sound bigger than little drums tuned down. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's that. Mm -hmm. um, you also learn that you can hit drums too hard, mm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, to the to point of diminishing returns. And you also learn it's all that works in synchronization with a great engineer. And this is a town of amazing engineers. Yes. And you learn what to give them to help them make you sound the best. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense at all. Well, yeah, could you exp 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 They're um, capturing what you give them, so give them something they can capture. Okay. You know, give them something they want. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, so it goes hand in hand with this. It's a pretty big you know, it obviously starts with a, with the source has to be good, right? You know, but the guy capturing it has to be equally as good. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot a lot of things play into that. I know it sounds crazy, but symbol height, placement, mm -hmm. them being able to put a mic where they need it to be. Mm -hmm. You know, and and you see a lot of guys. You know, their whole thing is they just want to be able to flop a stick and. And hit what they want to hit, and that's okay if you never have to mic the drum kit. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if you're playing at whatever the club is, and you're not micing anything, there's nothing wrong with that, other than it doesn't work in the other situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I have finally gotten my stuff. I, I guess you'd call it air balanced. You know, their place in the air. Yeah. Uh, you know, between the symbols and the toms. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It all kind of makes it work. When you play live, is your setup change at all? Or not a whole you, lot. Yeah, you've got. I you mean, it's still the same four drums <laughs> 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 and the same three symbols. What are you set up? I mean, is there an ideal uh, set that you're using as far as sizes? Well, or? in in the studio, everybody has really loved my big green slingerling kit. Mm -hmm. It's a Studio King kit. It's a 16 by 24, an 11 by 14, which I never understood why it was an 11 by 14 instead of a conventional 10 by 14, yeah. and I've just learned not to question it. <laughs> <clears throat> and a 16 by 16. 14, so, 16. Yeah. Wow. Uh-huh. That's awesome. But my 14's probably higher than a lot of people's 12's. Is it facing you? I mean, is it? Is it? Yeah, it's it's yeah. Mm -hmm. It's right in front of the snare drum, my, and my kick drum's cocked just a little bit so I can get it over. Okay. You know. Okay. I I remember seeing Chad Cromwell with Frampton, 
and uh, probably eight years ago or so, and his tom was really high. He plays them high, and he plays them very angled. Yeah. He plays it very angled as well. Yeah. Uh-huh. And um, I kind of go back and forth with that. I've never been able to play it. I, I've never been able to understand that the very flat, way far out drum. Oh, I, I, no, I, it's, it's, I um, can't do that either. I, I like, honestly, I like the way it looks. I just, everybody that does it likes the way it looks. That's why they do it. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, that my perception of it is, it is a very much an image thing that yeah. it, it has become a style to have low to the side, the bass drum way higher, yeah. you know, and you got to kind of figure out how to get over the bass drum to get to the floor time. You know what I'm yeah, saying? It's yeah, it's yeah. it's a yeah. style over substance. Yeah, it I guess look, it's, it does look cool. Oh, see, there's that picture. That's oh, yeah. I know that kit, man. <laughs> you know that. Notice that grimace. Something bad's happening right there. <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the, the listening audience, we're looking at a picture Mike has drummed up. Now, wait a minute. You've got two floor toms in this picture. I do. Okay, so you've got a 14. It's a 16, 11, 16, 18. 16 I, 18. I, that was, if I'm not I'm trying to think, that might have been on a Gretchen Wilson session. That might have been when we were cutting Redneck Woman. Because hmm. I, I know back, for some of the more aggressive stuff, like on Skinnered Records and and Montgomery Gentry stuff I played on, I would bring the 18 out so that, you know, I could do the a big boom, you know, mm-hmm. that those kind of things mm-hmm. occasionally. Yeah. yeah. So I, I keep the 18 with me. I just don't break it out that much. Um, it. Do you f- hear a progressive... Uh, progressive? Cut, take two. <laughs> Do you hear a progression of sound from like Strawberry Wine to Redneck Woman as far as the tone of the drums? It, it maybe it may be obvious from an engineer or a mixing standpoint, but do you feel like you, you're doing anything different from the time that you first started recording to the way you're recording now? Well, hmm. Because I hear, I hear a big difference. Those two are probably more similar. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference in some, like in the Dixie Chick era of stuff, because I was actually, at that point, I was playing a 10, 13, 16. Uh, so there was an extra smaller Tom involved. Yes. Now, and what I, Dixie Chick's records did you play? The on? first two albums. Okay. I had Fly. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Wide Open Spaces. Okay. I played on those two. Uh, I I had when I had first moved to town. I was trying to wrap my head around what somebody may need from a drummer if I was going to go to an audition or try and work with an artist. Mm-hmm. So I was pulling out records and listening to new records and 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 playing along with them. And Fly was one of those records I played a lot along mm. with. Um, and uh, and then doing other gigs and playing, covering other artists, you know, I've learned, as I know many drummers have, I've learned many songs that you've been on. Mm. So uh, it's been really good to just kind of, I feel like I have a a really good reason to transcribe and dissect and listen to what you've played. And, but I find it interesting to hear this difference in sound. Um, from those Dixie Chicks records or even, uh, well, I guess you say Dino, that was a little bit closer in sound. It was a little closer in sound mm-hmm. to, to to what I'm doing now. I, I at, at that point, I had a, I remember that kit was a Gretsch kit. It was a Caribbean blue Gretsch kit. It was a 12, 13, 16, like a 10 by 12, 11 by 13, 16 by 16, and a 18 by 22 bass drum. Oh, yeah. So, okay. You said there was a ten involved. In Not that? on the Gretsch kit. Okay. There was a ten. There was a ten by twelve, eleven by thirteen. I see. I see. Sixteen by sixteen. I see. And uh, so it's a little more of the bigger drum. I was using thinner heads back then, so that would have been a little bit of a sonic difference. Okay. Um, what kind of heads are you using now? I use coated emperors, smooth white coat. Uh, sh- let me back up. Smooth white emperors. <laughs> yeah. On the top, and smooth white ambassadors on the bottom, and I got that combination from Steve Turner, uh, who's a great drummer. Mm-hmm. And um, I played I played one of his kits one time. I went and filled in for him. He had something come up, 
and, and he needed a sub. <clears throat> and I went and played one of his AOT kits, and that was his head combination on that. And I remember thinking, this sounds pretty good. Yeah. So I, I started kind of trying them yeah. in different situations. And, and once I kind of figured out what the how to make the combination work, it's I've stayed with it. And it it's certainly what I always keep on that green kit. And and most uh, most yeah pretty much most everything else too really? as it turns out <laughs> um, I, you know it's it's the weirdest thing um, I, I love the way it sounds Pe- and people tell me they like the way it sounds you know engineers seem to really like the way it sounds it rings just enough yeah you know yeah um, the being the smooth white it, it's not as dark as the as a coated emperor right. You know, the, the, and I've always been told their smooth white mylar is a different mylar Interesting. than the straight clear head. Yeah, yeah. It's I've always been told it's a different mylar. So there's something on a molecular level uh-huh. that's different about that mylar, and it may have something to do with the sound. I don't know. And when you take that coating off, it's going to open up. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's maybe a little bit brighter. Yeah, yeah. I've done that. A but couple they times. last forever. I haven't changed heads on my green kit in four years. In four years? Four years. Huh. That's, yeah. That's a ringing endorsement. And they and they get played a lot, you know? Yeah. I can only imagine. <laughs> they get played a lot. But, you know, it's that weird, intangible, the way you hit with the size of the stick against the tension of the head on the size of the drum. You, you, all of that adds up to what it is, yeah. you know. And the stick being and able then, being able to keep a who's little holding high, that stick. Well, <laughs> being able to keep a little higher tension on the head gives it more resistance, so it's going to last longer. As opposed to having an am, an ambassador on a twelve that you got to tune way down to get it deep enough. There's no resistance, so. It has nothing to fight back with, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, you're going to go through them right. quicker. Uh, is there a snare, a go-to snare drum that you've been using, or when you go into the studio, or you have the rack of snares? I, I have a number of snares I travel with, and I, it's I pretty much always start with a. It's a '90s. It's not an old drum, but it's a chrome over brass six and a half superphonic. Mm-hmm. And people are like, great. So far, <laughs> I mean, it, it works for a lot, a lot of stuff. Yeah, you know, it yeah. covers a lot of ground, um, and it hears really well. You know, when people, in other words, it translates what the mic hears coming off of it. Okay, I, okay. I do use the forty-two strand snares on it. Oh, okay, and I, I put brass triple flange hoops on it, and. I probably put them on because I thought it looked cool, but they but they're brass. They're not brass plated. They're actually solid brass. So I th- I do think there's a, a little bit of a sonic thing with that, and especially on your side stick stuff, it gives it a little different. Okay, so a triple flange, not a die cast. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, I've got a copper six and a half <coughs> Gretsch that I kind of go back and forth between. A it was uh, Tommy Wells. It was his drum um, that I put a die cast and sometimes a triple flange kind of go back and forth. But if I can get away with a triple flange, it'd be nice. It opens a drum up. I think so. Yeah. I think so. I I mean, I pulled the die cast hoops off the screen slinger kit. It's a Studio King kit, so it came with die right. cast hoops on right. it. And the first couple, three months I was using I'm like, man, this Kit really kind of only works in one range, you know. It's very yeah, limited. Yeah. And I was a big diecast, you know, being a Gretsch guy for most of my adult life. I was very in tune with diecast hoops and what they did and how mm-hmm. they operated and all that mm-hmm. stuff. But on this kit, they didn't work at all, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. So I went and got some old Slingerland style stick eater, you know, uh, hoops. Oh right. You know the curved end ones. Mm-hmm. Super Sound King hoops or whatever they call them. I'm not real sure. The World Max ha- has a version of that hoop. Okay. And I put them on the, on those drums, and next thing I know, voila. I mean, wow. There everything the is, yeah. I even put them on my DW kit. 
Those it's, same hoops? Mm-hmm, those same hoops. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Do you uh do you have any endorsements that I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The, I can I can say without question, R- R- Remo has been very good to me, uh, and Vader. Uh-huh. I've known the Vader guys really kind of since before they were Vader, when they were still like a private label company. Mm-hmm. They used to make our sticks for the drum shop in Memphis. Okay. Our, right, our, right. Our, Vader our, did that for mm-hmm. many shops. Our, our custom stick. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, thank goodness they started capitalizing on their – great quality and yeah. you know became their own company and and they've continued to be very good to me okay. uh beyond that it's questionable um <laughs> I, th- I i i guess i technically have an arrangement with dw kind of mm-hmm. um and i've been on the zildjian roster since the early 80s and I'll probably live to regret ever having said that. I've just had trouble finding things that I loved hmm. w- with with them lately, you know. And, and I mean, you cannot argue the history of, of, of what There's they've done. There's some brand new A's that somebody was showing me that um, really opened my ears for the first time. Well, and, in, in, what they're supposed to be is they've gone back and done the A's of the 50s and 60s, you know, that everybody kind of grew up loving as Zildjian symbols. And yeah. they gradually, it be, it became another animal through whatever, whatever process causes that to happen. I don't want to call it a degradation, but there's a, it's drift, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's just drift over the course of many years. Like the machine didn't get calibrated. Or whatever it is. Or or someone thinking, oh, we can tweak this and do this just a little bit better. And it's like, no, 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 no. It was right. You should never change it. Use the same saucepan yeah. that you used. Yeah. They did the same thing with the Ks. The, the Ks of the mid to late 80s were amazing. Mm-hmm. Because they sounded like the best A's from 1966. That's, you know, yeah. that's what they sounded like. Yeah. And they quit making them that way. They changed the lathing, you know, mm-hmm. changed the profile a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just, I, I, I don't know, it's just, it's a combination of things that I'm sure not one of which make all that difference. But I guess when you add them up, it just changed things. Right, right. Um, yeah, I'm so it's it's bittersweet, yeah. you know, for me. I've been with them. I've been with them a really long time. And Lenny Demuzio was the guy that signed me, mm-hmm. you know, legendary guy. And and then of course, you know, he's gone and is at Sabian now. Oh, okay, you know, um, so that's to me telling in a way. Mm. Um. And I guess I was saying all that to say I've, I've been using, and anybody would know this, I don't really hide it, I've been using the Bosphorus stuff for the past few years. Because mm. right. they sound like Zildjian's from 66. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a couple. They just sound like the symbols I loved growing up. You know? And I have, I have a couple buddies of mine where we talk gear, and, and they say, well, if I want to talk gear, I, I call Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can babble. Um a couple other things I just wanted to cover real quick is uh, I, Gary had mentioned the band, uh, the world famous headliners. <laughs> he would, wouldn't he? Yeah. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys playing out any, any place? Uh, well, it remains to be seen. Our, our uh, Michael Rhodes plays bass in the band, and and he's leaving on a pretty extended tour with Joe Bonamassa. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I know we're going to do Delbert's Blues Cruise in January. Uh, it'll be catch as catch can if yeah. if we actually yeah. uh, get a gig around here. Uh, Big Al lives in New Mexico, so we have to catch him when he's here. Mm-hmm. Sean Camp uh, travels, you know, doing his own solo stuff, and he's in a band with Jerry Douglas. Oh, and, uh, cool. you know... He stays real involved with that. Pat McLaughlin plays with John Prine. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. You know, everybody has other things. It's just it's just an amazing lineup. Well, it is. Yeah. I, I mean, it is, and and I I question my involvement. <laughs> but oh, I will man. say this: it's 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 been some of the most fun I've ever had because it's so not nothing's really ever talked about. We did we did a new record. Uh, we we completed a new album, which is really fun. It's you know, it's it's like a barnstorming record. It's almost over before it starts. You know, it, it goes by so quick. But uh, we did it in like three days, and three of the tunes Michael and I had never even heard when we went in to cut them, which is not uncommon around here. You sure, know, you sure. knew, but still. We never really talked about anything. We just kind of they showed us what it was, and what fell out is what worked. And that band has been that way almost from the from the first note we ever played together. It I guess it's because it lends itself to a little bit of off kilter thinking, mm-hmm. in, in in some ways. Maybe a chance to do something different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So. But uh, we do we do have this new record and and hopefully we'll I, I I'm we don't have a company so we'll be putting it out if it I know it's on, I know there's uh, Amazon has, has some copies well that I'm MP3. that's the first record first record okay yeah. this is a this, yet this, a brand new record okay awesome so awesome but yeah anyway. um and then also one last thing is um. When Kevin Murphy was on here, like I had mentioned before, uh, he was really uh, upset that I didn't have Legos laid out for him mm-hmm, to play with. Mm-hmm. Just a, a pair of sticks and a practice pad, which he spent all his time on, <laughs> which was fine. And your name came up. He goes, if you can get Greg on here to talk drums and build a Millennium Falcon. I you mean like, like this one right here? That yeah, we... oh, yeah, but it's... Here, let me see. What are we doing? Could you just assemble this oh, Millennium yes, Falcon yeah. Oh, right Kevin, here? this is for you, man. Right there, and <laughs> <Turn Boom. it. laughs> it's, it's there. I built it. He built it. <laughs> there. Now. It... <laughs> oh, it's. <laughs> I built it wrong. Let's cut. Here we go. Do we need to go back and watch? No, I'm going to need my glasses. Is what I need. There we go. There it is. There it is. Kevin, Greg Morrow just built. He says he wants chicken. There we go. We'll get closer. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for taking the time to You're talk welcome. to us. And it's, it's just been great, man. Thanks for uh, the invitation to join this elite club of guys you've spoken with. It's been great, it's, man. I, I bet. I bet it's been an adventure for you. I've learned so much. Just every single day, you know. It's been great. Yeah. I appreciate you, man. Oh, no problem. Thanks, Thank Greg. you. Glad to do it. So, Greg Morrow, everyone, we want to thank him for his time. It was awesome to hang with him and to get to know him a little bit better. He's not much of a Lego builder, but I won't hold that against him. Secondly, thinly veiled as building community, I'd like to shamelessly plug the podcast with an iTunes comment from in 10 underscore Z. He writes, I've been listening to this podcast from the beginning and I have to say it has been wonderful. It gives great insight to what it takes to become successful as a working drummer in the modern music industry. The interviews are with drummers who are out there right now making a living doing what they love. Man, thanks for that. We really appreciate that. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to Mike Jackson for his help at All Things Technical and for the assist at our ongoing effort to get the YouTube channel up to a high standard. So thanks everyone for listening and spreading the word via all the social media outlets. Hope to see you around. Bye-bye.